um, His Excellency Antonio Guterres, Secretary General of the United Nations, the 40 permanent representatives to the United Nations and members of the diplomatic corps, including Ambassador Danny Danon, the permanent representative of Israel to the United Nations, honored guests and friends, and most importantly, our family of Holocaust survivors. My name is George Klein, a vice chairman of the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. I was born in 1938 in Vienna, before Kristallnacht, and arrived in the United States with my immediate family during the same year. But tragically, we lost, I lost my grandparents and many relatives. Our museum, founded by Honorary Chairman Maya Ed Koch, Governor Mario Cuomo, and Elie Wiesel, along with the founding co-chairs, <coughs> the Honorable Robert M. Morgenthau, State Senator Manfred Orenstein, and myself, was created as a memorial to the six million victims of the Holocaust, as a beacon of remembrance for the survivors, and to fulfill the commandment to remember and to never forget. Our current exhibition, Auschwitz Not Long Ago, Not Far Away, which has had over 130,000 visitors since its opening in May, demonstrates so viv vividly where hate could lead. On behalf of our chairman, Bruce Ratner, our president, Jack Klieger, and my fellow trustees, we welcome you to the 81st commemoration of Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass on the tragic evenings of November 9th and November 10th, 1938. Violent Nazi mobs destroyed approximately 270 synagogues and their artifacts in Germany, Austria, and Sudetenland, and plundered hundreds of Jewish businesses and killed or imprisoned thousands of Jews. Regrettably, only 75 years since the liberation of Auschwitz in April 1945 and the establishment of the State of Israel in 1948, we are witnessing a serious rise of anti-Semitism worldwide, especially in Europe, the Middle East, and in the United States. Each year, when Jews around the world remember Kristallnacht, there is both great sadness but also hope. Hope that such barbarism against Jews will never happen again. That governments like the Nazi regime will never exist again. And that neighbors will never again become complicit or morally complacent. The following words spoken by the noted Israeli historian and Holocaust scholar, Professor Yehuda Bauer, it spoke in the Bundestag in 1998 may capture the meaning and purpose of our commemoration ceremony this evening. Maybe, quote, maybe we should add three additional commandments to the Ten Commandments. You, your children, and your children's children shall never become perpetrators. You, your children, and your children's children shall never allow yourselves to become victims. And you, your children, and your children's children shall never, but never, be passive onlookers to mass murder, genocide, or to a Holocaust-like tragedy. Before we begin the official program this evening, which will include the keynote address by the Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, followed by speeches, by the Israeli permanent representative to the United Nations, Ambassador Danny Danon, <coughs> who chairs numerous important committees and has served since 9th, October 2015, and Mrs. Phyllis Heidemann, president of the March of Living. We felt that it would be meaningful to open the commemoration by sounding the only known surviving shofar from the infamous concentration camp Auschwitz. This chauffeur was smuggled out by Mr. Haskell Taidor in 1945, 
during the death march to Buchenwald concentration camp and epitomizes the ultimate symbol of spiritual resistance. Upon his liberation from Buchenwald, he immigrated to Israel and the chauffeur remained in his family until it was given on loan to our Auschwitz exhibition by his daughter, Professor Baumel Schwartz, for his first public view. Tonight, Rabbi Eli Babish from the Fifth Avenue Synagogue will sound this shofar, followed by the memorial prayer chanted by Cantor Yitzhak Meyer Helfgott, chief cantor of Parkey Synagogue, led by Rabbi Arthur Schneier. May I ask our chairman, Bruce Ratner, our president, Jack Kliger, with Louis Ferrario, director of Muselia and producer of this exhibition, to join us on the stage. Shnechneku 
وشنيسرفو وشنيك بروخاي Hashem, kulom kedoshim utehoyerim, arzei alevonon, vadirei atorah, bavur shekol anesafim kan. Nit palalim leilui nishemoi seyeh Ladies and gentlemen, it's, a, it's emotional, so please forgive me. I now introduce our distinguished guest, the former Prime Minister of Portugal and the ninth Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres. Before assuming the position as Secretary General in 2017, he served for many years as the UN High Commissioner for Refugees. His concern for displaced persons and human dignity has been at the heart of his portfolio for all his years in governmental and diplomatic service. It almost must be said that the Secretary General Guterres has been a reliable friend and an honest voice on behalf of world jury and human rights. 
just last year in marking Kristallnacht, days after the killing of 11 Jews at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh. The Secretary General said, anti-Semitism is back and it needs to be fought as the crime it is. Governments must clearly denounce and make evident the real risk of anti-Semitism in our societies today. Such a statement of moral obligation in defending Jews has been all too rare. In his closing remarks during his speech at the United Nations Assembly on Anti-Semitism in June of this year, he stated, I guarantee you that I will continue to call out anti-Semitism, racism, and all form of hatred loudly and unapologetically. We thank him for his extraordinary leadership and his integrity. You honor us this evening by being here. Ladies and gentlemen, His Excellency Antonio Guterres. Dear Mr. Klein, dear Ambassador Dannon, dear Ms. Eidemann, dear survivors of the Holocaust, dear friends, all protocol observed. It is such an honor to join all of you to mark the anniversary of the Kristallnacht program. Kristallnacht was not just the night of broken glass. It was the night of broken lives, broken families, broken societies, broken dreams. And as we know, that dreadful night of state-orchestrated terror was followed by days, months, and years of incalculable horror so tragically and movingly displayed in this museum. An exhibition as powerful as the one we have seen about Auschwitz truly say, as this truly stays with you, and it has indeed stayed very deeply with me since I first came here to experience it six months ago. It calls on us to witness and summons us to speak. After all, never again means telling the story again and again, especially in these times. As the title of the exhibit reminds us, hatred, anti-Semitism, and the Holocaust are not long ago, not far away. I feel this personally. Having grown up in Europe in the aftermath of the continent descent into depravity, and knowing that centuries earlier, my own country had reached its own depths of discrimination by expelling the country's Jews in an act of utter cruelty. And by the way, it was not an act of utter cruelty that uh, made so many people suffer terribly. It was a total stupidity. Portugal has paid an enormous price for it with uh, the lack of uh, development. And uh, a country like the Netherlands, for which many of the Jews from Portugal uh, left after a long circuit, has enormously benefited from their contribution. And uh, one of the most emotional moments of my life was my first visit to the, what we call the, the Portuguese synagogue of Amsterdam. And for those that have not been there, I strongly recommend the visit. It's a wonderful building uh, of the 17th century. And uh, I had the chance there to go there as Prime Minister of Portugal to present the law we had just approved to revoke the edict of expulsion of the 16th century. But I was dramatically impressed by the fact the synagogue was empty. The same Jewish community that had been expelled by Portugal was completely eliminated by Nazism during the Second World War, which proves how anti-Semitism goes on and on and on and repeats itself in history in terrible and tragic ways. I also feel it keenly today as head of an organization dedicated to preventing genocide and other grave crimes who sees and hears, as you do, chilling daily reminders of the persistence of anti-Semitism 
the resurgence of Nazi slogans and symbols, and the growing menace of white supremacy groups and other forms of intolerance. So it is right and necessary that we gather tonight to remember the Holocaust and the events that took place on November 9th and 10th in 1938. A member of my team that is here with us today recently told me that his father, at age 16, was trapped outside on that evening in Leipzig on his way home as violence began to swirl around him. He moved furtively from doorway to doorway as the mobs grew larger. And he went slowly from street to street as the flames shot higher, consuming Jewish shops, houses, and temples. He made it home safely, but shaken. His family had been in Germany for many years, prosperous and assimilated. Hitler had seemed to them an aberration, and even a buffoon, at least when heard on the radio. Five months later, this young man and his immediate family escaped Germany altogether, ending up in the United States. And I am very happy I can work with his son. But his wider circle of relatives was not so fortunate. Dozens perished in the death camps. So the exhibition we have seen today truly is not just an exercise in looking back. It helps us to assess our present and to recognize the need for continued vigilance. In recent months alone, across the world, we have seen the vandalization of Jewish graves, the defacement of Holocaust memorial, the burning of a yeshiva, and the spread of violent propaganda about Jews. And of course, it is just over a year since the worst anti-Semitic attack in the history of the United States at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh. I was proud to take part in an interface show of solidarity at a temple here in New York in the days immediately afterwards. Decades after the Holocaust, the world's oldest hatred is still with us. Other forms of intolerance are also taking a deadly toll, from bombings at churches to massacres at mosques to assaults on migrants and refugees. Hatred kills. But hatred also works in insidious ways to undermine relations between people and the foundations of society. In their quest for power, some political leaders are cynically bringing the loathsome views of extremist groups into the mainstream. And we see these both in authoritarian regimes and the liberal democracies alike. The online world has proven to be a boon for bigotry and violent misogyny. Terrorists and neo-Nazis are ramping up recruitment and radicalization. They are as shrewd as any Madison Avenue marketeer. They are as technological savvy as any modern teenager. Indeed, so many cases, teenagers are their number one prey. These groups post videos on the latest platforms and apps, often specifically designed to lure in, to lure in often unwitting young people. Their messages are filled with false promises of glory and real incitement targeting some of the society's most vulnerable people. Parents, teachers, political leaders, we must all act with urgency before underground hatred becomes an overt and alarming new normal. And the United Nations is fully engaged in this fight. In June, I launched a United Nations strategy and plan of action to confront and address hate speech, using our convening power, our human rights mechanisms, and our work for peaceful, inclusive, and prosperous societies. Education must be a key part of this preventive approach. And I'm announcing today that I intend to convene a conference on the role of education in addressing and building resilience against hate speech. We are also focusing on the protection of religious sites in the wake of deadly attacks on mosques in New Zealand, the Easter Church bombings in Sri Lanka, and other assaults. Just last month in Germany, a gunman killed two people while trying to storm a synagogue on Yom Kippur, the holiest day of the Jewish calendar. Two months ago, working with my high representative for the Alliance of Civilizations, I launched a plan of action to support member states in ensuring that worshippers can observe their rituals in peace. Houses of worship around the world must be safe havens for reflection and peace, not sites of bloodshed and terror. And last month, the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion or Belief presented his latest report underscoring that anti-Semitism is, and I quote, toxic to democracy and the mutual respect of citizens, end of quote. 
The United Nations and the Holocaust Outreach Program continues its work around the world with educational institutions, Yad Vashem, and indeed with this Museum of Jewish Heritage. And the imperative equality and human dignity will also underpin next year's observance of the 75th anniversary of the United Nations. Across this work, young people must be at the center. Tomorrow, at the United Nations headquarters, 100 high school students and their teachers will attend a workshop on the impact of the Holocaust on young people. I hope this exercise will inspire them to do even more, to challenge hatred, anti-Semitism, and to defend human rights. People are not born to hate. Intolerance is learned, and so it can be prevented and then learned. I will continue to call out anti-Semitism, racism, and other forms of hatred, and the exhibition we have seen, not long ago, not far away, compel us to work in the here and now to safeguard and uphold universal values for all. Thank you very much. Shalom, good evening. I would like to start by thanking my dear friend, George Klein, Vice, Pre Vice Chairman of the Museum of Jewish Heritage, for putting this event together. Phyllis Heidman, President of the March of the Living, thank you very much for organizing it. Mr. Klieger, President of the Museum, Mr. Ratner, CEO of the Museum, Mr. Richard Heidman, President of the AZM, my dear friends from the conference, Mr. Stark, Mr. Online, and Mr. Adler, the Vice President of the March of the Living in Israel. I want to thank Secretary General Guterres for his remarks. The Secretary General has been instrumental in creating awareness to the dangers of anti-Semitism. Besides speaking at the event we held at the General Assembly and joining us in declaring war against anti-Semitism, the Secretary General has initiated programs to stop hate speech and facilitated the publishing of an important report on anti-Semitism. We have many leaders from the Jewish community. We have seen the data, but for the first time, it was a UN report that was published about the threat of anti-Semitism. I would also like to thank all of the ambassadors in attendance. Many of you have joined us on one of the trips that we organized in collaboration with the March of the Living and the American Zionist Movement. We walked in Auschwitz. And I encourage each and every one of you to do that. It is not easy. But I see some of the ambassadors, Carmelo and others who joined me. Eli Wiesel of Blessed Memory said that once you enter the gates of Auschwitz, when you walk out, you're a different man. And I'm sure that the trips to Poland and Israel change the way you think about anti-Semitism and the importance of a strong Jewish state. Anyone who got into Auschwitz became a witness. Anyone who has spoken to a survivor became a witness. Anyone who has visited the important exhibit in the museum also become a witness. And as a witnesses, we have a moral obligation to speak up because the past can repeat itself. Tonight, we are commemorating the 81st anniversary of Kristallnacht, remembering what happened. It is important not only because of the destruction that was caused that night, but because of what now, with the perspective of time, we know that might happen again. Kristallnacht was a turning point. It marked the beginning of systematic violence against Jews in the Third Reich. 81 years later, now it is easy for us to see that Kristallnacht was a warning sign. However, at time, people did not see it as such. 
They rationalized it. They tried to ignore it. Remembering is important, because if we remember what happened that night, maybe we can prevent it from happening again. Today, we are experiencing similar trends. Israel's right to exist is being questioned, and it has become the target of anti-Semitically motivated boycotts. Some would like to think that the devastating attack in Poway, California, was a one-time tragedy. The horrific shooting in Pittsburgh was an isolated event. The incident in Germany this past Yom Kippur was a confined act, but they were not. They were a part of an increasing wave of anti-Semitism and anti-Semitic acts. History has taught us that if we don't take action and stop this wave now, the worst is yet to come. Anti-Semitism is a deadly disease that has taken the lives of millions and must be eradicated. Its symptoms are hate, ignorance, and intolerance. Like with any disease, the international community must work together to eradicate anti-Semitism. We must find a cure for those affected by it today, and we must vaccinate our population so that no one will have to suffer its fatal consequences in the future. In order to cure those affected today, each state must fight anti-Semitism in its society by punishing those who spread it. Zero tolerance policies must be put in place. New laws against hate speech and incitement must be passed, and more importantly, enforced. But in order to rid the world from this disease, we must vaccinate children and adults alike. The only vaccine against anti-Semitism is education. Education to ideas such as compassion, understanding, and tolerance. Vaccination must be a multilateral effort. We must educate that other does not mean inferior. We must educate that generalization is dangerous. We must educate that disagreements are never an excuse for violence. And we must educate that a Jew, a person of color, a refugee is still a person and should be treated as such. We must fight anti-Semitism because it, in, it endangers the lives of Jews. We must fight anti-Semitism because it, in, it endangers the lives of so many others. The state of Israel is the target of many anti-Semitic acts, but a thriving, strong, proud, democratic Jewish state is also the best answer to anti-Semitism. Israel has learned the lessons of history and continues to serve as a safe home for all Jews and to fight anti-Semitism wherever it raises its ugly head. Allow me to end with a quote by Primo Levi. Above and beyond our personal experience, we have collect collectively witnessed a fundamental unexpected event. Fundamental precisely because unexpected, not foreseen by anyone. It happened, therefore it can happen again. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Secretary General, Your Excellencies, our dear and honored survivors, our incomparable, indefatigable George Klein and the board of this incredible museum, I bid you shalom. As I believe many of you in the audience know, the March of the Living is a two-week educational journey encompassing two of the most important dates in the Jewish calendar, observance of Yom HaShoah Holocaust Memorial Day in Auschwitz, and celebration of Yom Ha'atzma'ut, Israel's Independence Day in our special Jerusalem. 
Since our inception in 1988, we have been committed to serve as active torchbearers of Holocaust memory and as an insurance policy designed and dedicated to pay tribute to those who perished, honor those who survived, and safeguard the fu future of Holocaust education, memory, and legacy. We embrace with fervor the importance of learning the lessons of the Holocaust and to stand strong against anti-Semitism, intolerance, and hatred in all their forms. I believe that as today, we are all facing a frightening rise in worldwide assaults against the Jewish people. Our mission of educating the next generation against the evils of intolerance and indifference remain as important as ever. We recognize, as you said, Danny, that in our hands we hold the most important tool of all, and that tool is education. For it is with education that we believe societies flourish and goodness prevails. As we will read in the Torah portion, Lech Lecha, this Shabbat, God commanded Abraham to leave the comfort of his birthplace and his home and go to the land that the Lord himself guided the Jewish people to. That land is, of course, Israel. Our educators from around the world, from 150 communities, guide our participants from their homes, their safe homes around the world on their journey, first to Poland to visit the sites of the darkest chapter in human history, where man's inhumanity to man reared its ferocious head, and then, thankfully, onto Israel, whose very existence is proof that with determination, with commitment and unwavering belief, each of us can make a difference in the human pursuit of life, liberty, and freedom. Following in the words of Elie Wiesel, one of our great mentors, whoever listens to a witness becomes a witness. Our students, therefore, become messengers and agents of change in the universal desire to provide a better world for the Jewish people and for all people everywhere. They learn from the past in the present with a new understanding that the future lies in their hands. They learn the words of the great Rob Cook, who proclaimed, I do not speak just because I have the power to speak. I speak because I do not have the power to remain silent. It is through their voice and with their action, their hopes and their dreams, that these, our young people, will help ensure that a Kristallnacht should never happen again anywhere to anyone. It is toward that goal that we are very proud to personally escort United Nations ambassadors from so many diverse countries and cultures around the globe and walk together on the grounds of Auschwitz, of Birkenau, in Majdanek and in Treblinka, and in the cities and on the streets of Israel. Ambassador Danone, my dear friend Danny, your vision for this initiative has proven to be both inspirational and impactful. As you, we believe that by addressing the issues of anti-Semitism and the need to combat Holocaust denial on the meaningful journeys that we take together, we have had a positive and meaningful impact on the narrative. Mr. Secretary General, we thank you for your support of these ambassadorial experiences, as well as your public determination to confront the issues facing the societies of the world with honesty, with commitment, and with fortitude. You have been a guiding light to the ambassadors who join us, to each of us, and I dare say to the whole world. It is with the goal of passing the torch of leadership on to the next generation who have the power to speak, the power to act, and the will to do both. I am pleased and proud to introduce my colleague and my very special friend, Baruch Adler, March of the Living International Vice Chairman, and two of our future leaders, two of those on whom we count that the future will be better for all, Hallie Goldstein from San Francisco, California, and Noah Tradonsky, who comes to us from Johannesburg, South Africa. It is through them and their actions, their commitment, and their work to provide a better world for our people and for all people that we, the March of the Living, devote ourselves today, tomorrow, and as long as we can walk. Thank you.
Thank you, Phyllis. Dear Secretary General of the United Nations, His Excellency, Mr. Antonio Guterres, dear ambassadors, dear survivors, dear honored guests. After the Shoah, many people proclaimed never again, but in recent years we have seen yet another radical upsurge in the rise of anti-Semitism and racism. Once again, in too many parts of the world, Jews are afraid to walk around the local streets wearing kippot, and synagogues and other Jewish organizations are adding extra security to their institutions. Right here in the United States, just over one year ago, the worst hate crime in the history of this country took place with the murder of 11 innocent Jews praying at Pittsburgh Etz Chaim Synagogue by a hate-filled white supremacist. Since 1988, the March of the Living has brought close to 300,000 people, students and survivors, Jews and non-Jews, political and religious leaders, to Auschwitz-Birkenau on Holocaust Remembrance Day, where they march side by side in memory of all victims of Nazi genocide and against prejudice, intolerance, and hate. The vast majority of these participants are young people, sincere, dedicated, and idealistic. And we, at the March of the Living, realize that it is only through these young people that we can hope to change the world. So we decided to create a follow-up program for a select group of March of the Living alumni, the cream of the crop. It was important to us that these young people be as diverse as possible, female and male, religious and secular, coming from all the continents around the world. And so, for the first time in our 32-year history, earlier this year, 21 of our top alumni participated in the first ever International March of the Living Emerging Leadership Conference on the Shoah and combating anti-Semitism, racism, and intolerance. One of the most moving moments of the 2019 March of the Living was when all of these 21 leaders stood on stage at the end of the Yom HaShoah ceremony after the Holocaust survivors had just recited the Kaddish and three of the representatives read, read the young leader's proclamation, following which the Atikva was sung with the young leader still on the stage. Watching these 21 leaders on the stage read their just crafted declaration and then sing Atikva was like watching the passing of the torch of memory and leadership from one generation to the next. I will, now, I will not now like to invite two of these wonderful young leaders, Heli Goldstein of the United States and Noah Tradonsky from South Africa to share with us the eloquent declaration against anti-Semitism and racism that the young people wrote and shared with us at the 2019 March of the Living in Auschwitz-Birkenau. Heli and Noah, please. We are the Jewish people. We have always been a small nation with a resonating voice. Our 4,000 year old story is rich with love and triumph, though rife with hatred and tragedy. In places near and far, there and here, we have known anti-Semitism. Targeted, chased, expelled, isolated, killed, and nearly exterminated, we are the Jewish people. We knew anti-Semitism then, and we know it today. Acts of anti-Semitism and all types of hatred are further spreading the destructive impact of intolerance. Standing here today together, Jews and non-Jews alike, we must not remain idle in the face of evil, no matter its form or expression. It has been said, the path to Auschwitz was built by hatred, but paved by indifference. We have the ethical obligation, not only as Jews, 
but as human beings to transform the world we see into a place where we want to be. Reaching that goal requires us to understand that simply refraining from evil will not allow our vision to reach fruition. For it is in the active pursuit of goodness and the relentless search for kindness that humanity may fulfill its potential. With this declaration, we vow to be builders of the future, not victims of the past. And here today, we pledge to stand tall in the face of bigotry, raise our voice against anti-Semitism, speak out against racism, and commit to loving all our neighbors as ourselves. We, we are, are the, the Jewish, Jewish people. people. I'm Bruce Ratner, and I'm fortunate enough to be chairman of this extraordinary museum. And um, in closing, what I really want to do is thank all of you for being here. And I especially want to thank George Klein, who both was the inspiration for the exhibit, the inspiration for tonight, and has been such a leader in our community. So thank you, George. <laughs> but it is to you, Secretary General, that the real thanks go to. Because to come to this museum tonight is more important than you can know. It touches all of us that you would take the time, that you have made the effort in the past, and you make the effort tonight. It is touching and moving for this museum. And I've been in many, many different um, programs at this museum. And in some ways, this has been the most touching to have you here. Um, your work on both preventing anti-Semitism and your work on human rights is unparalleled. And we are touched and moved and inspired by your being here and what you said. So thank you so, so much, really. <laughs> and, and Ambassador Danant, your words were moving, important, and what you do for the state of Israel and for the people is noticed and acclaimed, and we thank you also very, very much. <laughs> and to the March of the Living, March of the Living, since 1988 has been one of the most important part of remembrance for Jewish people and for really human rights and for the world. So we thank you, Phyllis Heidemann, and the March of Living, the emerging young leaders especially. Your youth and your freshness is something that we will always remember. And to all of you here tonight, well, let's, I think that's your special thank you. To survivors and all of you here tonight, we welcome you, we thank you, and we hope to see you soon again. Thank you all very much. <laughs> the exhibit will be open for another hour. Please go see it. It is obviously extraordinary and wonderful and moving. Thank you all for being here. <laughs>